for the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, May 23, 2017. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to be led by Abby Workmeister, first grader from Vincent Farm Elementary School. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Ms. Workmeister. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <coughs> Our first item on our agenda is consideration of the agenda. Dr. Dancer, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Uh, there are none. All right, hearing none, is there a motion to accept the agenda? So moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, then. Agenda as prepared is going to be the agenda that we follow. Uh, next is selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public <laughs> prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box to my right, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers tonight. Bosch Farone. Paul Mercier. Marion Moore, <coughs> Steve Prumo, Five. Jennifer Bolster, Six. Jennifer Hines, Seven. Leona Hall, Eight. Ryan Bra uh, Robin Bromley. Very good. Uh, the next section uh, is public comment, um, and this is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer concerns to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board, uh, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing resolution processes. Um, I ask you to observe the three-minute <coughs> clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the, uh, the buzzer. Uh, the microphone will be turned off at the end of your three-minute period. I now call our advisory group members uh, who have signed up to speak tonight. The first one uh, from TABCO is Abby Baton. Ms. Baton. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. Um, I was going to uh, welcome our newest board member. I thought he might be here tonight, but uh, we wish him well when he You'll does have to hold arrive. Till June. Till June. Okay. Uh, we would also like to remind this board that working conditions in the schools have a great impact on student learning, as well as to perform the best work possible for their children. TABCO believes that every student and staff member should be provided an appropriate environment for learning and working. When facility issues arise that impede learning, we believe it is BCPS's obligation to make timely decisions that provide sufficient, sufficient accommodations or to close affected facilities. The safety of students and staff should be the top priority when making these decisions. Further, we believe for the safety and well-being of all teachers, students, and staff, and I know we're doing this, but it can't come soon enough. All Baltimore County Public Schools must be fully air conditioned. We have been very fortunate this spring for the most part, and certainly during the winter, but after three sweltering days in a row last week, non-air conditioned schools were front and center again. We hope that in the next three weeks we won't be faced with any heat waves, but they should not be ignored if they do come to be. Finally, with change comes exhilaration and, of course, concerns. We wait with great anticipation on the announcement of our new interim superintendent. 
We look forward to working collaboratively with this new superintendent to help move Baltimore County Public Schools to even higher levels. And again, a thank you to Dr. Dance for all the work that he has done. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Baton. Our next speaker is from the Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, and that's Elizabeth Hembling. <clears throat> Which one? <laughs> you just, that's perfect. Good evening to Dr. Dance, Ms. Johnson, members of the board. Um, boy, it is my honor to be here as a parent representing CCAC this evening. Um, I've known many of you, and you've heard from me over the years. So um, I'm the mother of a dyslexic child, if you don't know me, and I'm also a member of Deconing Dyslexia Maryland. And I'm here to discuss a contract that will be coming up within the next few weeks for your review. Um, this is a contract for Orton Gillingham. The contract number is MBU 51317. And many of you know me from my many years of advocating to combat reading failure within BCPS. Many of you have heard me recite the dismal statistics for years regarding the low literacy rates that many programs have tried to improve and have crossed your desks. We have known for years how to fix this problem, and this contract will do that. I know that 95% of all kids can learn to read if taught via Orton Gillingham. It is time to implement these methods within Baltimore County. I recently attended the CCAC meeting on dyslexia. At the meeting, they had a panel of teachers who had received 60 hours of Orton Gillingham instruction. They spoke to parents about how this changed their world. Teachers described being able to make progress with kids who have never improved. They were able to see these improvements in very short periods of time. One teacher lamented how she used to hate writing IEPs because she had nothing to say to parents regarding the progress of their children. She was elated to write them this year because finally there was so much to say she couldn't wait to write her IEP reports. Some describe these 60 hours of training as some of the most impactful that they've ever had in their careers. If you don't know anything about Wharton Gillingham, this is not a boxed program. This is a diagnostic way of teaching that is individualized to the child. The child only moves forward when progress is made. This empowers teachers to be creative and investigative in their approach and is really teaching at its highest level. These teachers went into teaching to impact children, to make a difference. They were excited and reinvigorated at the meeting and were finally able to make an impact at the res as a result of the training. And I contend that proper teacher training will also reduce frustration and also boost the teacher retention, which has always plagued this county. This contract is the beginning. There is so much work to do, but this is a start. The contract must be approved and more needs to follow so that several teachers from each school can be trained for at least 60 hours. Orton Gillingham will have the biggest impact <coughs> on the 60% of BCPS kids that are now reading below proficient. Orton Gillingham is an evidence-based method that we know works if teachers are properly trained. And we thank you for all of your support. Thank you very much. <coughs> Our next speaker is from AF AFSME, and that's Michael Fahey. Good evening, Good evening. Chair Gillis, uh, Vice Chair uh, Ms. Johnson, and Dr. Dance, being, um, members of the board. Um, just wanted to talk a few words about transportation. Mr. McRae is going to speak, uh, the Director of Transportation is going to speak later, and I'm sure he's going to be elegant and uh, poetic like Robbie Burns, <laughs> but he'll also have a bag of promises that would probably make Donald Trump jealous. <laughs> um, he probably has a bright, bright colored packet to impress you, but let me give you the black and white. Drivers, bus drivers and attendants are worse off now than we were one year ago. Uh, we still have some supervisors who intimidate and harass drivers and attendants. There's favoritism, cronyism, <coughs> nepotism is at an all-time high. Um, I call it the friends and family plan. Special needs drivers work all year but, and should be classified as 12-month employees. Bus attendants need to be upgraded due to the stress and demands of their jobs. 
we haven't had a labor management meeting with transportation for about six or seven years. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Fahey. Our next speaker from the Northeast Area Education Advisory Council is Thor Trigbison. Good evening, board members. The inadequate proposals for Perry Hall Middle School by Dr. Brown prompted me to come back much sooner than I thought I would have to. As a representative of the Northeast Council, I would once again like to put spotlight on the overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle School, which Dr. Brown's suggestion completely failed to address. Student population at Perry Hall Middle School will, will reach 1,960 kids this fall, which is 317 kids above state-rated maximum, a complete ORAMS elementary school above capacity. The Office of Transportation didn't have a stellar year with severe bus overcrowding that only is going to get worse with increased attendance. Perry Hall will need at least 45 school buses, probably more, to provide transportation for these 60, 1,960 kids to proceed. Multiple buses had over 60 kids per bus last year. Now is the time to figure this out and avoid the catastrophic situation that plagued Perry Hall transportation last fall. Bus overcrowding, three to a seat, and kids sitting on the floor has to end now. Dr. Brown's suggestion to solve the overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle was more trailers. We want to point out that 25% of all trailers for secondary schools in the county are already at Perry Hall Middle. For the county middle schools, three out of every four trailers are already at 4300 Ebenezer Road. Adding more trailers at Perry Hall Middle, as Dr. Brown suggested, is simply not tenable and a wasteful spending of taxpayer money. Students per classroom ratios are 50% higher at Perry Hall Middle than the average of all middle schools in the Northeast area. Perry Hall Middle has the lowest numbers of devices per student in the Northeast area, along with Golden Ring. Perry Hall Middle has by far the lowest number of library media per student. This is unacceptable. Perry Hall Middle has the highest number of students per assistant principals, more than twice as many as students uh, at Golden Ring. Perry Hall has the highest number of students per teacher, has more students per counselor than any other middle school in the Northeast area. We've heard parents complain about counselors that can't work with all, their ki all the kids there. Parents have complained about their kids waiting hours for help from the nurse team at Perry Hall Middle. This indicates understaffing on a variety of levels for Perry Hall Middle. It needs to be addressed and the situation is unacceptable. We have unprecedented numbers of students in the middle school and current staffing suggestion by Dr. Mayo are simply inadequate for school of this size. BCPS needs to reevaluate the staffing ratios to be more in line with student population of this magnitude. Under Rule 1280, the superintendent may initiate a boundary study to maximize available space in schools. We urge Dr. Dance to start that process now. We cannot wait, and adding more trailers to the recreational space at Perry Hall Middle School is not a viable option. The area is already looking like a trailer park city. Dr. Dance, please don't let this overcrowding become your legacy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trigginson. Uh, it's now time for public comment, and our first speaker is Bosch Ferrone. Evening to all. I apologize for my casual attire. <laughs> um, Dr. Dance, I'm really, um, I have really enjoyed watching you for the past years, especially your courage. Your courage in dealing with the issues, your courage of appearing with the media is something I've never, never seen in my good 20, 22 years of um, watching the school system. Uh, another impressive thing in you is your enthusiasm, your, your love and care for the kids, and it really shows in your body language. As you know, I'm a physician, and I can read <coughs> body language reasonably well most of the time. Sometimes I don't. Um, Having said that, I want to move along to say to you that there is no religion that is justified 
to commit act of violence against innocent people. No religion, no matter what the name of that religion. No religion has the right to take somebody else's land or resources. And I uh, really feel terrible about what we all have seen. But nonetheless, the lesson is, and that's why I'm here, is that we have to respect and uphold the First Amendment, the complete separation of religion from government, from school systems. And I think that's really important. You would know that in the past 22 years that the school system has closed on Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah without secular reason. It's very obvious. No superintendent, no president, no chair, no one has ever really shown the proof of that secular reason. And closing the schools costs $3 million each time the school system is prolonged. So we have $172 million over the past 20 years for closing the schools on the Jewish holidays. And watching the school system, I believe there is some collusion between special interest and the past boards. I ask you to look into that and request a refund of the $172 million and put it in building the schools and taking care of the overcrowding and all the other things that we are really dealing with. So again, upholding the First Amendment is something that really drives me to kind of come and bother you each time. Um, I lived back there. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Mercier. <clears throat> Chairman Gillis, Dr. Dance, members of the board, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to address the serious safety and overcrowding issues that Towson High School is facing and to ask that you include planning funds in the fiscal 2019 budget for a new Towson High School. <clears throat> Since I last spoke to you on May 9th, several new issues have come to light. A recent Baltimore County Fire Department safety report dated just last week confirms an issue that I presented to you during our last meeting. The report states, and I quote, unsafe condition due to water leaking on building's main electrical panels, end quote. As we're all aware, water and, water and electricity are a recipe for disaster. Additionally, the backup generator, a necessity in order to power emergency lighting in the event of an emergency, is out of service. In fact, the generator was last serviced over 18 months ago. Of particular interest is that there is no record of a fire safety inspection having been conducted in 2016, and the most recent inspection is dated two days after the Freedom of Information Act request was submitted on behalf of those seeking a new Towson High School by 2022. The fire department is not the only agency noting safety issues such as these. BCPS's own physical facilities assessment dated from 2014 lists several safety concerns, including the corrosion that is evident in the same electrical system and ceilings that are in poor condition. In fact, there are some areas where the ceilings have completely failed and are creating significant health hazards. The same report rated Towson High School as the third worst high school in the county in terms of building and its systems. The infrastructure, of the, the infrastructure of this 68-year-old school, one of the oldest in the county, is failing and likely beyond repair. Towson High School is quickly approaching the point where it will no longer be capable of keeping up with the emergency technology in the classroom, one of Dr. Dance's top priorities over the last several years. Chairman, at the last meeting, you stated that innovation must continue. How can innovation and technology thrive in a school that is one rainstorm away from disabling the entire electrical system? The same BCPS report that I referenced earlier forecasts that Towson High will be at nearly 140% capacity by 2021. This room this evening is sitting about 85 folks in here, pretty crowded as you can, I would agree. 140% uh, we're talking another 32 folks in this room, just to put that in perspective. With the continued development and growth within Towson's core and within Towson High School's boundaries, it is very possible that this forecast does not accurately reflect the, reflect the actual overcrowding that Towson High School will experience in the years to come. The reality of today is that our children face situations that didn't exist when we went to school, situations that may require an immediate evacuation of a portion or even the entire school. The school as it's currently built 
coupled with the severe overcrowding, may very likely prevent a safe and orderly evacuation. The one issue I'm sure we can all agree on is the outstanding academic results that Towson High School has been generating. I ask that you choose the, public, the place of safety. Thanks, Mr. Mercier. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. My job is so difficult. <laughs> I saw a, um, a quote online, and this is not exactly how it's written, but this is basically what it said. The system had us thinking legal means right, but remember, at some point in our history, slavery was legal. So when I read this, I thought, wow, this is a, it's deep, but it's a great segue to the ethics policies that you all are reviewing. At some point in America's history, and even now, it is ethical to do inhumane deeds or actions shall I say, toward people because of their race, religion, age, income. It's unfair, it's unjust, it's unloving, it's not compassionate at all. And not only do we as adults have to deal with these um, inhumane ways that we treat one another, but children, the children, your children of the school system, they see it on the news. The teachers have to discuss it in class, um, or some choose to discuss it in class because, of course, children want to know, well, why is this? And this is generational. And I've even found as an adult, I have to have difficult uh, discussions with uh, adults that are my elders because of the belief systems that our country were built on. I would highly suggest that, yes, ethics, equity, training should be done. I think that if teachers are required to, you know, to keep their jobs to, and have a practice exam in order to keep their job, then I think all teachers and administrators should be quizzed on their on civil rights, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 in order to keep their job. Because I would rather my child to be treated with love and respect than discrimination and segregation. And if the teachers of the school system is not trained on that, then we're gonna have a problem. So please, let's solve this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Steve Prumo. We're impressed that it still fits. It's not buttoned. <laughs> Good evening, board members. Uh, and thank you for this time. So as we know, Towson High School is the oldest, most overcrowded high school in Baltimore County. And the only one that fits that category where the board has no plan for Towson, for the school. In 2015, the state did an assessment, March 9th of 2015, where they noted significant deficiencies at Woodlawn, Overly, and Towson. These schools are listed for limited renovation projects in the fiscal year 2018 and subsequent year capital improvement programs. We strongly suggest that these fiscal year 2015 reports be provided to the architects and engineers in order to ensure that the scope of their designs addresses all deficiencies in the facilities. We're not sure that that's actually occurred. Paul mentioned a recent Freedom of Information Act request 
for fire records for Towson High School. So this is the actual document of the request. We requested it May the 15th. Usually these inspections are done in January and February. So in 2013, 2014, and 2015, fire inspections were done, and in each three of those years, there were no notes of activities required by Towson. Everything was fine. In 2016, as Paul mentioned, there was no inspection. We requested this May 15th. All of a sudden, there's an inspection dated May the 11th. And then the fellow who signed it dated it May the 17th. And that's where he lists unsafe condition due to water leaking on building main electrical panels. We have pictures of that. That, that leak is live as we sit here tonight. Remove obsolete manual pull station for kitchen hood suppression system. System has been discontinued, no longer cooking and creating grease-laden vapors. Building generator out of service due to repairs, and as Paul mentioned, the date of the last report or inspection was 2015, and that generator controls the emergency and backup lighting. The group that I've been working with has a survey out. We've heard from about 400 community folks. 95% support funding for planning in fiscal 19. 81% suggest that overcrowding in the age of the school affects learning negatively. 70% suggest private, private funding ought to be considered. 69% suggest that we should increase taxes to deal with these issues. On a scale of one to five, Overcrowding safety, mold, electrical panel, plumbing are considered extremely important to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Bolster. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Bolster, and I too am part of the Towson High School New and 22 Committee. And I could easily spend the next three minutes talking about the close to 70-year-old, 120% overcapacity, mechanically, structurally failing Towson High School. But I believe Paul and Steve did a really good job of that. I'm actually here tonight to call on this school board and the county administration to reject these cheap Band-Aid solutions to our crumbling schools. It's time for a new comprehensive plan, one that addresses Towson but also addresses all the other crumbling schools, one that builds on the current school for our future, the one that the schools for the future slow down the de degradation of our schools, but it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't address the last three decades of neglect that were inflicted on our schools. If you look around this room tonight, you'll see representatives from schools all over the county, and we're all fighting for our children and their health, fighting for air conditioning, for ceilings that don't rain water every time it rains, for intact floors and sidewalks that aren't crumbling. We were fighting for scraps, paint jobs, and roof patches, instead of the 21st century learning environment that every child in this county deserves. And don't tell me it can't be done. There was a time in this county when I was a kid and when most of the board, not Mr. Stewart or Aslan, uh, were, were young, and these school buildings were fantastic. From 1950 to 1965, 15 years, Baltimore County built 90 schools. That's six schools a year. Our parents' generation raised the taxes, borrowed the money, and they did what was needed to do to be done to invest in us. And right up through the early 90s, there was regularly scheduled maintenance on these buildings, and they were in good working order. And this county then went cheap. We stopped proactive maintenance, we reverted to Band-Aids and deferred maintenance, and now we have an administration that, bags, that brags about a $250 million surplus while our drinking fountains are all shut off in the schools. And the trailers outside of our overcrowded schools are as prevalent as the weeds that are coming up through the cracked sidewalks. And we're surrounded by counties that are doing the right thing. And our families are leaving Baltimore County and going to Howard County, Harford County, Carroll County, where they build state-of-the-art schools, investments that attract great families and growing businesses. In Harford County, their oldest high school was built in 1974. And they're talking about replacing it because it's so old. 
Your school board website states that this board is empowered to construct, rent, and improve school facilities. Now, I know it's not that simple. I know there's a lot that goes into this. But with a change in the leadership in BCPS and in the county in the next two years, the retirement of our uh, chief administrative officer, now is the time for this board to assert their power and strongly advocate for a new Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Hines. Good evening. Good evening. I would like to address the board tonight to follow up on the Victory Villa boundary study. There are a few flaws in the process that need to be addressed. Public feedback was requested to be made through the boundary study email address. These emails were not acknowledged until a few meetings into the process when the principal of Vincent Farms suggested they be posted online for the committee members to review. This was a task designated to be done on the committee members' own time. The emails were not also not posted in a timely manner. All emails were supposed to be posted publicly as they were received, but instead were posted on a weekly basis, leaving much lag time on public feedback. The maps that were provided by the boundary study only break the areas down by planning blocks, street names, and current school boundaries versus proposed new boundaries. If the number one consideration of the study is to maintain continuity of neighborhoods, it would be vital to know which areas are considered neighborhoods along with their respective names. Many of these areas have long history, while others are quite new neighborhood developments cause, causing the need for such a study in the first place. It is impossible for a contractor based out of Dublin, Ohio, to know the ins and outs of Baltimore County and our neighborhoods, and this is crucial information for the committee members to have as a tool throughout this process. This request was made of Mr. Cropper by a committee member at meeting number five and was never produced. Another consideration, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect the diversity of the region. Again, how can this be achieved without knowing the number of minority students for each planning block? These should have been specified at the beginning in order to provide the proper information to achieve the overall task of the study. Average attendance of 16 to 23 members is unacceptable than when there should have been a total of 34 members at each meeting. This leads to members not being aware of all the data that was reviewed and discussed during the meetings. Several members stated they didn't know about the added seventh final meeting scheduled for April 20th. The significance of this meeting was not addressed either as the reminder email almost made it sound optional to attend, stating, the goal of this meeting is to recommend one option to present to the Board of Ed at their May 9th meeting. If you are unable to attend or have any questions, please let me know. There is no mention of you, the committee members, will be in charge of nominating a map option to present as the recommendation or the option of making slight modifications. The reminder email that was sent the morning of the 20th did not convey to the members that this was the overall summation of the work that they had invested over the last five months. With this said, meeting number seven was the most crucial to this process as voting occurred on the option that would be deemed as the committee's recommendation. This needs to change in the future so every member is in attendance and the recommendation is a true committee recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Leona Hall. Good evening. I also would like to address the Victory Villa boundary study. It wasn't until after numerous emails and speeches at the public hearing meetings that the 10 absent committee members were reached out to for their feedback. This should be part of the policy. If voting committee members do not attend the final meeting, BCPS Office of Strategic Planning should reach out to them for their feedback and opinion immediately. If members did not attend the meeting, they were encouraged to watch the live stream videos. With respect to live streaming, two emails have been sent regarding the final meeting number seven, which is missing the entire first half of the meeting where members were nominating maps for recommendations and discussing why they chose these mapped options. The full live stream video would show Mr. Cropper spe speaking about public block number 38 and how he created all map options, which this slight change per discussions that had been in prior meetings. I can recall at the recommendation to the board meeting on May 9th, Mr. Cropper specifically stating 
over and over that he did not recall this request for anyone. Yet at the meeting, he specifically stated he created map options for all maps, even F1 option, because he was being provoked and thinking someone may want a map with public block number 38 moved. The nomination process should be slightly changed as well. Members were supposed to independently review materials for option nominations for only 15 minutes after each given data review. This did not allow enough time. Also, nowhere on the option nomination guidelines does it state that each committee member was only allowed one nomination. After one member tried to nominate a second map option, then it was addressed by Mr. Cropper stating that the members should only nominate one map. But they could speak on behalf of another map and hope that someone else would nominate it. The Orms community has recently repeated, repeatedly offered new options and data to impact at least overall all students, rather than having a BCPS representative state that this is not a one school process, that one school should not return the boundary process. The work and data that has been offered throughout this entire study should not so quickly be disregarded. Instead, it should be reviewed with the same regards as all options created by a company from over 400 miles away. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robin Bromley. Good evening, Dr. Dance and members of the board. I'm here to urge the Board of Education to approve the five-year Orton-Gillingham contract MBU 51317. My children, both diagnosed with dyslexia, thought they were stupid. The children in their class had figured out that smart children know how to read and stupid ones don't. The reality is that children who can't read at five or six or 10 or 17 are not stupid or lazy or defiant or not trying. It's that no one at the school knows how to help them. We were tipped off to our oldest having dyslexia when her talented and dedicated teacher who has a master's in education in reading told us, I've never been trained in this, but there's something there. I think maybe dyslexia? We didn't wait to see if she grew out of her reading struggles. We had her evaluated and started her with an experienced Orton Gillingham tutor. We had her retested exactly <clears throat> one year later. Within that year, my daughter's scores on the Wyatt 3 in early reading jumped 69 percentile points for reading comprehension, 52 percentile points, and in alphabet writing fluency, 58 percentile points. I have hard data that Orton Gillingham works. We've continued every month, kindergarten now through third grade, with Orton Gillingham tutoring so that to ensure that our girls become fluent readers able to access grade level material because we have no other option. I love my daughter's school and I see so much good there. I also see dedicated teachers with years of experience who have no idea how to teach dyslexic children. This is wrong and unfair, but not just to dyslexic teachers and their families, it's unfair to the teachers and the administrators, people who are dedicating their lives to teaching our children not to have the skills they need to help struggling readers, especially when a proven method such as Orton Gillingham is available. When I attended the CCAC meeting on April 3rd of this year, I was thrilled to learn that the Orton Gillingham teacher training discussed in March of the previous year was a great success. The testimonials from the teachers moved me to tears. These experienced and dedicated teachers finally were able to help their students. Orton Gillingham and structured literacy made a positive difference for their struggling readers when nothing else had worked. Baltimore County Public Schools need a comprehensive strategy that includes universal screening for dyslexia, early instruction in foundational reading skills, ongoing teacher training at all grade levels, and evidence-based intervention methods like Orton-Gillingham and Wilson. I strongly urge the board to approve the Orton-Gillingham contract to continue the excellent work that was started this academic year. In closing, I would like to thank the board. I'd like to thank Rebecca Ryder in the Office of Special Education, Megan Shea in the Office of Language Arts, and all who I cannot mention by name who were involved in the 2016-2017 Orton-Gillingham training. Thank you for all the work you do for all students in Baltimore County Public School Systems. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for the work you're doing to help dyslexic children and their families. Thank you. thank you very much. Our next agenda item is item F, new business, and it concerns appointment of an interim superintendent, and I call upon Mr. Virch to provide a motion. 
now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I move that our Board of Education from Austin County appoint a former Woodmore Elementary School student who was also a former Woodlawn Middle School student who was a graduate of our Woodlawn High School, a graduate of Towson University, a master's degree recipient from Notre Dame of Maryland University, a doctoral candidate at Morgan University, a former teacher and teacher mentor in our Grange Elementary School, former professional director, uh, former director of professional development for our system, a former <coughs> assistant superintendent for schools, um, former assistant principal at our Mars Estate <coughs> Elementary School, and of course, former principal at Seneca Elementary School, currently the chief academic officer for the 25th largest school system in our United States. And I would add a particular note, the proud parent of two Baltimore County public school students, that being Verlita White as the interim superintendent for the period of July 1st, 2017 through June 30th, 2018, subject to the board and Miss White entering into a mutually agreeable contract and further subject to the statutorily mandated approval of the Maryland State Superintendent of our schools. There's a motion by Mr. Virch. Second. second. There's a second. Is there any discussion? Mrs. Miller. appointment of an interim as an opportunity for a fresh start. This is a one-year interim appointment. If Ms. White seeks the permanent position next year, she'll be evaluated in her performance over the coming year. There are many areas in the system that leave room for improvement. Some are quick, easy fixes, while others are more complex, costly, and long-term. But many improvements can be started immediately top of the priority list must be discipline and safety issues, which can be improved immediately by changing the focus from reduction of suspension numbers to reduction of incidences of violence in our schools. Another example is improving the culture in BCPS in which staff on all levels feel intimidated to express anything contrary to the directives from the central office. I will be watching for prompt action from Ms. White on these and many other critical issues. However, I am sorely disappointed with the flawed process our board leadership has conducted in this interim selection process, but I want to be clear that this is not a reflection on Ms. White. The fault rests entirely with our board the majority of whom are hiding behind the confidentiality of closed-door meetings. Those members of the board owe an apology to Ms. White, to stakeholders who have given input on the process, and to every applicant who had the expectation of a fair opportunity for consideration. The actions of those members have been misleading and a failure to properly discharge their duty. I am certain that Ms. White's leadership will exceed that of our board. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Are there any other comments? Mrs. Johnson. Yeah, so I actually received um, a few handwritten letters from, from students in fifth grade from Ms. Kara Detweiler's class from uh, Johnny Cake Elementary. I'm not going to read all of them, but I went through and just kind of highlighted some things of what they were looking for in the new superintendent. So they asked that, uh, I hope that the new superintendent believes that children can always do great, and just because they are a different race from each other doesn't mean they can't accomplish the same thing. Another student says, I would like to have a female because I think she would do the job and get it, get it done well and be our friend and help us. Another student says, I think a superintendent should believe that children can do anything they put their minds to and help, and, and she can help them and help them never give up. 
Another super or another child uh, writes in Spanish. La educación de, de la mejora tiene una mejor de jefe porque uh, yo ta uh, también somos mujeres en nuestro grado y hay 11 mujeres, pero yo uh, pero hay muchos más hombres. No es bueno. In other words, she said that there are a lot of boys in her class, and she really wants a woman to be the superintendent <laughs> because it's not good. Um, and then lastly, my favorite was, I would like he or she to be nice and not do everything grotesquely, like Gollum in The Hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that beyond those, uh, I look forward to you not being grotesque like Hobbit. Thank you. Are there other comments before we ask for a vote? Mr. Chairman. Oh, go ahead, David. Go ahead. Um, Bill Felder. I, I would like to address the public and be sure that the comments made by Mrs. Miller are those of Mrs. Miller and may or may not be shared by other members, but certainly not by me. I am a big proponent of selecting from within because I believe that the course we have been on for the past five years uh, has shown that we are one of the most excellent educational systems in the country. And I know that Mrs. White shares uh, the continuing effort to move this school district ahead. Mrs. Miller talked about some things that bother her. Uh, I, I could stand here and point by point argue each one because I don't really think that they are the essence of her school system. Our system runs because of how we are funded. And I'm proud to say that in the past five years, school system has received in excess of maintenance effort from our county executive every single year. Prior administrations were not so lucky. And you all know, as well as I do, that money runs to the system. Without the money, we don't have the teachers, we don't have the excellence, we don't have the programs. I know Mrs. White is a believer in the fact that you have to maintain strong ties with our administration and our public elected officials because they really provide the funding that keeps us going. So I am proud to say that I am a proponent from within and I am sure that Mrs. White will do an excellent job. Other comments, Mr. Virch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I made reference in a very long-winded way, and I apologize to Miss White because I know what a uh, retiring, uh, modest person that uh, our Verlita is. But I would be remiss if I did not say that when I referenced uh, our, our Mars Estates Elementary School and her tenure there as an assistant principal, that I, I would be remiss if I didn't share the story with you. Uh, not unlike what happens in many of our elementary schools or many of our schools. A principal will, will take an assistant principal, a new assistant principal, and say, come with me. I'm going to show you the community, the neighborhoods where our students come from. And those of you who are familiar with our eastern Baltimore County, who are familiar with Mars Estates, Back River Neck Road, um, neighborhoods within that school boundary. A number of those were built during World War II. Um, many of our working poor lived in these um, um, neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods had some of the highest calls for emergency services that our county um, offers anywhere in our county. Verlita, in her role as an assistant principal, went to these neighborhoods when students from those neighborhoods would not be able to find their way to our Mars Estates she went door to door in these neighborhoods because she values literacy and the positive impact that literacy can have on the students in this county. It is our future. It must be a literate future. I saw her speak Friday night at our Seneca Elementary School celebrating 50 years of education excellence in that area. The chief academic officer and as I introduced her, the doctoral candidate took that stage among many loving people who remember her time there during a very difficult time in that community's history when 
as I refer to it, Hurricane Isabel, as she referred to it, Tropical Storm Isabel. Either way, it wreaked havoc in that, in that community. And while the school may have been closed, teachers came into the school. Berlita is the principal, and we know our principals are the glue that hold our schools together. And those community schools help hold communities together. And Verlita and her staff and volunteers and citizens in that community helped begin the healing process and rebuild that resilient community. These strengths, this, the, the, these personal qualities are the qualities that I look for as a person who grew up in Middle River, a product of our school system, I'm proud that we have a graduate of one of our high schools, Woodlawn High School, going to be the interim superintendent for our system. I gladly vote for our Verlita. Other comments? Before I call for a vote, I'd like to say that the, uh, the announcement of uh, Dr. Dance's resignation uh, causes us to have to find an interim superintendent. It requires us to act swiftly. Uh, and it requires us, with the state superintendent's approval, to have someone in, in um, a position of superintendent leadership uh, from July 1 of this uh, year until June 30 of next year. Uh, there will be plenty of time in the year ahead for this entire board to have a complete national search, if they so desire, to uh, address a permanent superintendent. But I am, and I think I speak for everyone here, just so very pleased that we have such a such a talented person as Verlita White, and I have the f full confidence that she will be a great leader of our system. Uh, with that, I ask all in favor of Mr. Virch's motion to please say aye. 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 All right, the motion carries. Mrs. White, congratulations. There'll be plenty of time for Mrs. White to speak in the days ahead. <laughs> Congratulations again. Uh, next on our agenda is item G, um, and that is personnel matters. And for that, I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, members of the board. Good evening. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements, resignations, and area education advisory council appointment. Do I have a motion to approve personnel matters G1 through G3? So moved. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Thank you. Next is item H, administrative appointments, and for that I call Dr. Dance. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. I would like board approval for the following administrative positions. Principal Essex Elementary School, Principal Scott's Branch Elementary School, Assistant Principal Pikesville Middle School, Coordinator of Title I in the Office of Title I, Coordinator of Teaching and Learning in the Office of Special Education, and Executive Director of School Support in the Office of the Community Superintendent for Zone 3. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit H? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Dr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce uh, several new members of our team who are being promoted and one who is returning to us um, in a principalship capacity. First is for the principalship at Essex Elementary School, currently right now an assistant principal at Lansdowne Elementary School. That's Brooke Wagner. And Brooke, congratulations to you. Do you have any family or friends here with you this evening? Um, And they can stand up so we can recognize them as well. Congratulations. Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Next is for the principal position at Scotts Branch Elementary School. Currently right now an assistant principal at Burdensville Elementary School in Montgomery County, but used to be an assistant principal with us at Pleasant Plains Elementary School. I'm joined here by her mom and dad who are educators, um, and Mamie Perkins, who is a um, a colleague of mine, former uh, deputy superintendent in several roles in Howard County, and former interim superintendent in Anne Arundel. So thank you, Dr. Perkins, for joining us and congratulating your daughter on coming back to our system. That's Miss Lauren Tillman. <laughs> and Miss Tillman, do you have any family or friends here? Obviously, with you this evening. <laughs> Maureen 
So the entire family can stand so we can recognize them then. Come on, the whole audience up. stand up. <laughs> and I know Mr. Tillman is proud too, and a former principal at Centennial High School, correct, sir? Thank you. Congratulations again, Mr. Tillman. Welcome Mr. back. Perkins. Mr. Perkins, sorry about that. Um, next is for the Executive Director of School Support and the Office of Community Superintendent, currently right now the Director of School Performance in that office, that's William Bates, Jr. And William, other than uh, Dr. Martin Knox, do you have any other family or friends here? Uh, I, I do. I have my wife here, Carla. Congratulations to you. Next is for the assistant principal position at Pikesville Middle School, currently right now a stat teacher at Southwest Academy. That's Sheila Lutchfield. So do you have any family or friends here with you this evening? Okay, everyone can stand up so we can recognize you. Congratulations to you, Sheila. Next is for the coordinator of Title I in the office of Title I, and currently right now a supervisor in that same office. That's Ms. Michelle Stansbury. And Michelle, do you have any family or friends here with you this evening? Okay, and they can all stand so we can recognize them. And last but not least, coordinator of teaching and learning in the Office of Special Education, currently right now an assistant principal at Middlesex Elementary School, that's Brenda Workmeister. <laughs> Brenda, other than Mr. Virch, do you have any other family or friends here with you this evening? <laughs> Okay, and everyone can stand so we can recognize Yay. you. So congratulations to each of you on your promotion. I apologize, Mr. Perkins, for the slip of the tongue. Thank you. Congratulations <laughs> to each of you. Very good. Next on our agenda is Agenda I, action taken in closed session. I invite Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. Thank you. Good evening. Last week on May the 18th, the Board of Education considered an appeal in... Not anything that you said. <laughs> oh, no, it's all the same. I'm used to it. I think it's the haircut, Mr. Gilman. <laughs> um, the Board considered an appeal regarding a confidential employee matter uh, in closed session in, in an oral argument. There were actually two consolidated appeals that were heard together. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the actions taken by the Board in that closed session in those matters, which were hearing examiner numbers 15-63, consolidated with hearing examiner number 16-08. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session as described by Mr. Nussbaum? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, very good. That there carries. will be two orders for everyone to sign over at the table later. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda is uh, agenda item J, and that is contract awards. Uh, there is one contract that's before you, uh, KSH 318-17, and we ask Mr. Saris to present for us. Uh, this is a uh, new contract for our Home, uh, summer homeless program for high school students. Um, we are we cooperate with Baltimore City on this contract, and the city has recently reissued the contract, and so it appears before you as a new contract. Even though we've had this program in place for four years, um, and sponsored by the Y of Central Maryland. And it is uh, grant funded, and we are asking that uh, this contract be awarded for a period of a year with the option to extend for four years. Um, Very good. Are there questions to Mr. Saris? Mrs. Causey. Good evening, Mr. Saris. <coughs> is this uh, $631,500? That's the 
spending authority if we extend the contract for four years? The, that would be the value over, yes, the total of five years. And it's primarily um, the McKinney uh, Vento grant funding. If that were to change, uh, uh, we would have to find an alternative funding source. What, what did you say was the name of the grant? The McKinney provided? Vento Federal, Federal uh, Act uh, for Homeless. And that's students. what we have used in the previous yes. four years. Yeah. So there is the possibility of it being renewed. Yes. Um, and in the past four years, um, how many students have been uh, benefited by this program? Uh, we started out uh, with one high school and 30 students, and that is currently expanded to three uh, high schools uh, for with a total of 80 students that you see listed here. Well, my next question was about um, how are the students and schools selected? I Okay, so it's only 80 students total for this program. Over the course of one summer, yes. Okay, so how are the schools and then the students selected? Uh, I'm gonna have to ask Dr. Wisted to provide that detail for us. Come on forward. Good evening. Good evening. Um, the, the schools were selected based on need. So the highest um, group of students that were eligible to participate came from these three high schools. Um, so is the need criteria um, dictated by the McKinney-Vento program? Right. And, um, and what age and year in school are, th are these students? So it could be rising ninth through 12th graders. Okay. And students participate in the extended year learning program and then um, participate in a work opportunity where they're paid. Okay, and um, do you have statistics for the results from the last four years in terms of the number of students that were involved, how many of them graduated, or are successfully advancing year by year? I do not have that information, but we could get that for you. Okay, that would be great, thanks. Any other questions? Mr. Virch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dr. Wisted, thank you for coming up. Uh, and I had sent an, an email out earlier, and I do appreciate your prompt, timely response. Uh, my question was because in, in our 6th District, there is our Parkville High School, which has a sizable uh, homeless um, uh, student population. And I asked about what other sort of options there might be, and you were kind enough to uh, indicate that, uh, in fact, um, we have this extended day learning program in the summer mm -hmm. at our Parkville High School. Is that, is that correct? And yes, it, and all, it, you, all the high schools. Yeah, excellent. And if mm -hmm. you could just briefly uh, highlight what, what happens during those summer months in this program. So that's just the regular extended year learning um, program that is offered to all high school students. So it would be for credit recovery for any child. So it's no different than what others can access. Mm -hmm. This program is a little different because it um, offers a breakfast and a lunch for the children and they do a work program. So that's not offered currently at Parkville High. I see, okay. Thank you very much. Mrs. Miller. Yes, thank you. Um, the original contract served 30 students for three years. So a total of, let's say that would be 90 students. Okay. Uh, the con this program, the original, yeah. the original. Um, we, I think we added, um, we expanded to two schools in 2015, I wanna say, um, and then to three uh, within the last two years, I believe. Okay, so my numbers may be a little off, but based on what was in the summary that it, the original contract was 175,000 and that would come out to be just under $2,000 per student per year. But by what you're saying, it might be lower or lower than that really. Yeah. Now this contract serves 80 for one year for over 631,000. Five year contract. Five, five years. It's 106,000 a year. A hundred and six thousand. Okay, hundred. 
So what about is about fourteen hundred hours a student per year, though? About fourteen hundred hours per 14, student. Okay, so that's that's pretty close to what it was <clears throat> before. Has there been changes in the program and what they're offering? No, it's it's essentially most of what's listed here. Uh, it includes meals, transportation, as well as a extended learning component so that there's instruction that takes place. There's eight weeks of work and four weeks of um, the schooling. Okay. And uh, along the lines of what Ms. Causey asked, what data would measure success of this program? We could pull information as far as how many credits the children recovered um, success rate in, in future employment after they participated in this work study. So those would be the two criteria that, that you would say would measure success? We can get credit that information for you. But I mean credit recovery and employment afterwards. Yes. Okay. Thank Mrs. you. Mrs. Gauzy, do you have another question? I had a comment. Um, the the reason for my question, and I believe Ms. Miller, about the cost, even though as um, Mr. Ufelder was saying that it's being currently paid for by a grant, that if we have a program for our homeless population that is in fact um, being very successful in helping them, then it's one that if we lose the grant, we may automatically want to pay for, or if it is a really very successful program, we may want to scale it up some to help some of the other students in our school system. So that's why it's important to understand the cost per student and how many kids we could potentially add and help in this way. So thank you very much. Is there a motion to, oh, Mrs. Johnson. Yes, thank you. Um, this is just for the benefit of those that are at home that don't necessarily have the contract in front of them. I wanted to go over some of the highlights which um, were mentioned. The workforce development, academic enrichment um, are very important, but the daily breakfast, lunch, and snacks as well as the, the, the paid worksite placement. So I think those are, you know, of course we want measurables afterwards, but to have our homeless students make sure uh, they have a, a warm, you know, a, a meal, breakfast, lunch, and snacks, and paid worksite development are, are free measurables, I would think. Yeah, over the uh, past four years, we have gotten some economic development funding from the county's workforce development program as well. Great, thank you. Is there a motion to approve item J1? So moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Thank you. Next on our agenda, item K, new business, a report on transportation. For that, I invite Mr. Smith and Mr. McRae forward. Chairman Gillis, Vice Chair Johnson, Dr. Dance, members of the board, and guests. It is, uh, I'm joined today with, uh, with Mr. David McRae, our Director of Transportation. It is our pleasure to give you an update on transportation. But before I do that, I want to thank this board for your support over the last several years as we have um, approached the painstaking effort of reshaping our transportation options. Um, we have been working diligently with school, schools, communities, um, parents, and students, Hazelin, and students as we go through this process to make sure that we can be as efficient as possible. Through your efforts and through your support, we've been able to um, leverage technology, technologies that can help our operation run smoother and more effective and more efficiently through the advent of AVL, the electronic routing system, as well as the, the many men and women who work in that department. They make this engine run, no pun intended, but they make it run every single day with their efforts in making sure that we transport um, our students each and every day. Um, we're gonna give you a brief update on what our 
plan was when we started this and how we can update you on where we are. And yet and still, we still have quite a ways to go to get our plan fully laid out. But through your efforts, through, through your support and our effort and the continuous support with our communities, we look forward and we're pleased about where we are now. But we know that there's some work ahead of us. With that being said, I want to turn it over to David McRae, who will go through the presentation. Well, thanks, uh, Kevin, and uh, good evening, everyone, uh, members of the board, Dr. Nance, Mr. Gellis, and Ms. Johnson. Um, what we wanted to do, first of all, um, was just give you a quick reminder of our, our key priority areas that we identified um, at, at the beginning of this program, as Kevin said, this time last year, um, uh, and just put them up there as our, our, our key um, areas um, that we want to focus on um, over um, the whole time, as Kevin says, as we reshape. So safety and training, um, customer service, uh, our students with special needs, um, recruitment and retention, and uh, our electronic routing. And I'm, I'm going to, because that was our original, I'm going to use, you know, as Kevin said, all, all aspects of technology. Um, uh, an update on our, our safety and training um, practices. Our training program, and particularly in our pre service, um, continues to exceed the, the state mandated standards um, for drivers and attendants. Um, uh, we had orientation and cases reviewed by uh, new members of our Pupil Transportation Safety Advisory Committee, who are a committee of, of the board um, and the, the superintendent. Um, and what we want to do is, is begin to utilise uh, a lot of the data that we're getting um, to really inform our future training programme development, as we're seeing there, taking all sorts of data, whether that's from from accidents or whether it's from um, other safety elements that we're dealing with on, on the bus on a, on a daily basis and really start to take that data and inform our, our training programmes as we move forward. Our customer service, this was a, a big area for us um, that we were, were looking to make an immediate impact on um, this year. Um, we went to one of our partners in the county, uh, to CCBC, who really came on board uh, with us and, and uh, developed a course with us, which was very specific to our staff. Um, we, for the first time, uh, established some of our customer service call metrics and get some real baseline numbers there. Um, and as just to moving on to the next area where um, the new BCPS serve system will give us a real opportunity this year to, to track a lot of uh, those calls and really help us to, to solve a lot of the, the issues that come through our systems um, and utilise the technology available to us there. Um, our communications and customer service unit is now up and running. Our, our, uh, our specialists started yesterday. So, um, uh, and we have uh, some some uh, clerk staff that are about to uh, go into place. They've been hired as well. Um, so uh, we're really looking for uh, uh, the next uh, school year start to put some of those metrics that we established last year and really start to get some, some good benchmarks um, that we can improve on. Uh, an area that we, we really knew we wanted to start to identify is our students with special needs. Um, we've, uh, uh, and I, I, I know that there's been some tremendous accolades already this evening for our uh, special need, Office of Special Needs. Um, the Office of Special Needs in Baltimore County Public Schools just basically uh, got their sleeves rolled up and started working so closely with us um, when, when we identified this area. And they continue to do so um, on, a, on a daily basis if it's to, to solve an individual problem. But we meet with them on, uh, on a planned monthly basis and as necessary as well. Um, we have short-term plan and we just met last, last week um, to put our, our long three-year term plan um, that we can work very closely with the state staff as well. We also 
had uh, some very specialised training from um, the specialists from the, the Maryland State Department of Education to work with our supervisors, and we're working closer and closer every day with them. We uh, are, have ordered some, uh, what I would say, the smallest school bus you can possibly get, but still be in the school bus format this year. Um, to try to help us get to some of the locations um, that are tight for us. Um, uh, it's still what you would look at and you would look at it and say, yes, it's a, it's a standard uh, type one school bus, but it's tiny. Um, fitted with lifts as well. Can take 30, uh, uh, 30 passengers, but we'll configure them um, for the needs of those particular runs where we're taking them to, to real some, some tight areas. Uh, recruitment and retention um, is, again, was identified as, a, as an area for us. We had um, upgrade of our driver positions and salaries uh, from 1st of July. Uh, we continue to have um, monthly recruitment events with our, our colleagues in the Office of Staffing. And we've really started to look at where we're having those and how we're, we're reaching out to them and, and the Office of Staffing have worked very closely with that. We're using uh, workforce development and employment centres um, as well as uh, we actually had one in our Butis Library last week as well. So we're varying where and when we're having our recruitment um, as well uh, and working very closely with the Office of Staffing. Um, Retention is definitely a major focus for us still, and we really want to work with all, all partners that can assist us with retention of staff. Um, the nature of the size of our system means we have a high turnover. So um, it's, a, it's an area we really want to continue to work hard on as we move forward. Electronic routing, we, we went um, live at the beginning of the school year. Um, uh, we, we had some initial challenges that we worked through with our partners in the schools um, uh, and, and have continued to do th so throughout the school year. Um, we will uh, begin to phase in our uh, special needs and ESOL routes into the electronic routing system. They're more complicated um, than the general education routes, but we will begin to do that this year. Um, uh, we had a tremendous partnership with our uh, colleagues in uh, IT um, to make right some of those student information system and electronic routing uh, glitches that we had at the beginning of the school year. And we had a development program which we went through January to July and uh, we're delighted with the progress. We actually had a, a progress meeting this morning. Um, very exciting for this uh, upcoming school year is our automated vehicle location. Um, all the uh, the fitting and installation is now complete on our school buses. Um, we've actually used the program on, on a couple of occasions already, even though we're, we're starting to go live for our summer programs and full implementation um, for the school year 17 and 18. Again, just to emphasize safety, we, we, our absolute priority is to keep our students safe. Um, our levels of service we want to improve on, a, on an every, everyday basis, um, and that's to all our stakeholders, um, internal and external. Um, and uh, efficiencies are going to help us to do that better um, in our system. Um, it will make us a, a tighter operation. As you can see, Mr. McRae has hit the ground running. Um, he has been engaging. Um, this is the gentleman that calls me at 5.30 in the morning saying I'm at their beauty slot just to have coffee with the guys and gals as they go out. Um, that's the type of teammate I want to be arm to arm with, shoulder to shoulder with as we do this work. Um, our drivers are having more access to him and to this process, our attendants, um, our staff in the transportation department is embracing this reshaping of how we're doing our work. Our, our unofficial motto is we're gonna find a way to work smarter, not always so hard, because they work extremely hard each and every day. So we're trying to leverage those technologies and those um, 
efficiencies that we can make this operation run smoother and we will continue to do that with your support and this leadership. With that, Mr. McCray are here to answer and I are here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. McCray. Thank you, Mr. Thank Smith. Mr. Yulfelder. <clears throat> Mr. McCray. But let's put all this in context. Let's give some people who may not know some numbers. How many buses do we put on the street? How many contractor buses? How many students do we provide transportation for? How many employees in the total Department of Transportation? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the size and scope of that mm -hmm. uh, organization uh, first has to be put on the table because a lot of what you said is directly related to the size and, and the complexity uh, of mm -hmm. what we do every day. So perhaps you could give us some just some ballpark numbers. Before he comments, let me, let me say that. When we started this presentation, we clearly thought about putting all that data, but as we thought about it, we say this is what we deal with every day, and we wanted this presentation to show you what we're doing as we move this forward. So we will definitely give you that information, but we wanted to make sure this information was about what we want our public to see each and every day. The behind the scenes of what we do, we got it. We, we know what it is, but, but, we'll, but we will but present I think it. the size Absolutely. Uh, lets us understand a little more about what you presented mm -hmm. and some of the difficulties. Absolutely. And, and some of the uh, programs that you are developing uh, in relationship to the size certainly is a monumental task. Absolutely. Yeah, we can, can give you a flavor of that. Oh, you yeah. know, we have a flavor. I don't know sure. the exact. Just a, a, absolutely. Um, we're running, you know, uh, about 827 routes per day, and some of them are tiered to have four sections to them. What does um, that mean exactly? So that would mean that there's... Um, uh, a high school, a middle school, potentially two elementaries uh, in a route. Okay. Okay, so, um, and not all, some will maybe have three parts, some will have four, and some of our longer, um, or our special needs runs that are coming from uh, different places may, not, may only have two sections to them and so on, yeah. So, um, 895 board-owned buses, um, uh, and we have 130, currently 136 contractors working for us, of, of which six of those are temporary. Um, so um, uh, we, we have 11, 11 facilities that buses w w go out of, four full service maintenance facilities as well. Um, uh, all our buses have to have A and B inspections a inspection once a year, B another three times, so four times a year. So that's a, a continuous uh, process as well in our maintenance department. In addition to that, the, this fleet management handles all white fleet and right. vehicles that we have in service too. So all of the um, almost 400 uh, trucks and vans that we have in the system as well as um, a, hand, a handful of vehicles that we have, they manage the entire fleet across the district. How about a little bit as to um, what it takes to be a driver from ter terms of certification mm -hmm. and experience and things like that? Yes. Right. So um, when you train, we our training program, when we said about um, what Komar says you must do in training, our, our training program is a class of a full week of 40 hours. Um, if you're a driver, in addition to that, you'll have um, 10 hours, uh, 10 two-hour sessions of what we call behind-the-wheel training. Uh, in addition to that, um, we are certified to train uh, drivers. We're also certified to test. Obviously, not the same trainer will test. Um, so we, we, we test and train uh, our drivers in-house. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, when you come to our recruitment, there's, there's steps to take. Um, uh, and, and in some ways, that's a, it's a positive. We're giving people a, a profession. Um, but sometimes it takes a bit longer. Um, and so sometimes that can be a little bit of a, uh, of a tough hurdle for us. So um, uh, not everybody that comes to our recruitment goes, oh, yes, that's definitely for me. But we want the people that, uh, that really do take that as a profession and we, we bring them on board. Do, do you have any idea of how many miles per year from all of our buses? And I'm sure it's in the millions of miles. But yeah, it's, it's in excess of 14 million miles if you put it all together on a daily basis. When we do do a, a time and mileage at each uh, sort of 
term, if you will, um, because rights change and we add special needs students in the year and so on. So, yes, Thank it's you. in excess of that. Thank you. Mr. Stewart. So I had a couple of questions. One was you mentioned improvements or driver salary upgrades. Can you provide us with any specifics on that? Um, our drivers were previously grade four and they went to grade six um, in the in the pay scale. Can you tell us practically what that means? Um, a driver starting today will be will make uh, once they are full time salary that the hourly rate for that would be fifteen forty eight per hour. And where was and that's it before? Sp scale one uh, was about twelve ninety six before. All right, and that would be step one. Fair enough. So, so what, what do you mean by that step one? Um, as in the the first step in that salary grade was where it was. That okay. was grade four and they moved to grade six. Okay. So on a related note then, as you look at retention rates, mm -hmm. obviously the hope will be not only will we attract more bus drivers, but we'll retain them over time based yeah. off of their competitors. What would you hope for a target retention rate in three to five years from now? It's, it's hard to say because when we when we have a, a, a large turnover, uh, or because we have a we a lot of our our um, our staff are will be in a retirement type mm. uh, mode as well. So when we're looking at retention, um, it's actually very related to the demographic of of the applicant as well. Um, we are seeing a lot younger people looking to, to come into our, the profession. I have noticed that at our recruitment events, and I go to every recruitment event. Do you know what so the average age of our bus driver is? I could, we, can, we, we could get, get you that. Yeah, we could get you that, but uh, I don't it's have that. It's changing um, ever so gradually. It used to be um, a more mature staff, and now, you know, we're getting, we're getting I won't say it's, I'm not saying it's a flood, but I'm saying we're, mm -hmm. we're getting younger drivers, then that's not something that we've traditionally have gotten on average as we... Which ostensibly should affect retention mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. over time. And we did have a retirement of a driver last week who had 49 years service. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Wow. It started as a, as a mum in her 20s. A lot, of our, a lot of our drivers have had pre-employment and they've worked somewhere for some period of time and then they've come to us as a transition to a different, um, to a different work opportunity. So as far as, sorry to continue, okay. as far as technology goes, obviously a big part of this will be the adoption of those who are dealing with on a day-to-day basis, including our drivers. Do you see that being a challenge? Do you see that being well adopted by our drivers, by our staff? and crews and so forth? Mm -hmm. uh, the, w what a driver needs to do in a daily basis with the technology that we're implementing, they, they don't have to do anything different. Um, what we're able to do... Disrupting what has been done for many years or the routes that maybe some of them are used to over time. Um, more, so, more so response time. Uh, when you have manual route sheets, um, when, when you make a wrong turn or something, someone has to get up get that route sheet and say, where are you? And they've got to figure that out. And that could be one minute, one hour, whatever the case may be. Now with some of the technology you have, we, we have more real time where that bus is. We had an example that took place last week mm -hmm. where we got a call about a bus not coming to a stop. We went straight to our database and looked at it and, and I let David yep. know what I heard. Mm -hmm. And he said, the bus was there. Unfortunately, it was three minutes early. A sub so nice to be able to backtrack. Right. And so a, a sub driver ran the route that day, had had gone to the stop three minutes early. Mom had come out with the student afterwards, so we were able to say we can definitively say, yep, the the bus was there at this point in time. Apologies, we'll put that right. So and just to clarify, this is a little bit of a different subject, but to confirm my understanding, will this technology be, be able or enable us to have a better conversation about school start times and about our use of transportation assets um, as, that, as it relates to that process. Uh, that it could certainly help guide that discussion, but the key focus in that discussion is the tiers. The tiers and the associated decoupling of those tiers in order to adjust ride time. So it certainly w will help in identifying what our matrix are and how do we do that, but the, the biggest 
uh, com component of that is the tiers, the and multiple tiers. the assets. Correct, because as you have tiers one. where if you, you're, you're having three and sometimes four tiers, so buses are going elementary, middle, and high, maybe not in that order. Right. And as you change that, it's going to have a, mm. a ripple effect on every, every other one that we have. So mm. we certainly will use the technology in order to make decision making as we explore that, but how we uh, um, have dialogue and discussions with schools, communities, uh, this board and, and staff about how do we approach the, the tiers and the associated costs with that. So, yes. And it, it may well inform, when we see a layover time of a particular period, for example, it may, it may tell us, oh, it's better to break this one up and put it with this one mm. because there's 20 minutes layo layover time. Right. Well, I actually, put it with this one, we can <coughs> narrow that down and use that one over here. So it will help us because electronic writing will give us a good good information base on student demographic and where they come from and where we should have the bus come to to a stop, for example. Well, now L AVL will couple with that and tell us wh what that means in the actual timings of the routes. All right. So All right. it will start to come together a bit more. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Eaton. Thank you. I would like you to address um, one of the problems that the gentleman <coughs> raised earlier in the meeting about students sitting on the floor and maybe three to four students on a seat. Is that still mm -hmm. happening? Um, we, when we've been given notification of that, obviously students sitting on the floor is not, is not how we should be operating. And so when that's been brought to our attention, we've uh, either made sure that the driver was instructed that they don't go before, um, making sure that people are seated. Um, uh, and we're, uh, we've needed to adjust numbers uh, on buses. Um, we've done that. Do we still have three per seat? Um, we, our goal um, for high and middle is two per seat and elementary three per seat. Um, we, uh, for some runs that, that we may, in a, in a middle school, have three to a seat for a particular shorter period of time. Um, that's not our goal. Our goal is for two for a seat in high and middle. Um, we're not always able to do that 100% of the time. And that fluctuates. Some of the actual riderships on buses fluctuates. Um, but we, we alter that wherever possible. And are you relying on your bus drivers to give you this information, or do you have a student count per bus, and you would know automatically how many children can fit in those seats? We, we work with our partners in the schools as well. There's, there's a lot of staff on site at the schools as well that work with our, our supervisors um, and our routing assistants where we need to make alterations. So yes, we get information from drivers, but also from schools. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Miller. Hi, Mr. McCray. Hi. Um, I appreciate that this is a long-term <coughs> fix for all the, the issues. Um, however, you've been focusing on what's to come, you know, for next year and whatnot. Can you explain what you've seen happen? What improvements have happened over this last year uh, since you last gave us an update, and specifically the ones that the parents and the students would say, yes, this has changed? Mm. Um, I think we're um, we're responding faster, quicker to our inquiries uh, from families and from schools, um, uh, and uh, that 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 would be my point number one. I think our customer service level has risen, um, and um, like I said, I'm I'm really looking forward to BCPS serve giving us more than anecdotally that. Um, so um, I would say uh, that, that from that point of view, um, we, we are addressing our, our uh, if it's to do with a late bus, if it's to do with uh, an element that something that's happened on the bus, um, we are responding to it, you know, quicker and more efficiently. Um, we've uh, certainly worked uh, very closely with our schools on issues happening on the bus, um, because um, the bus can be a reflection of the classroom sometimes too. Um, 
uh, and that's something that we want to continue to increase um, is the partnership with the schools and how we can help with that. We're actually housed with safety and security. We're, we're, we're talking and working with them on a daily basis if we have any issues like that in the bus. Um, and I think we're responding to that. Uh, uh, whilst it's still a, a tough part of the job, I think we're responding to it uh, with those partners very strongly. How about ride times? We, we are, that, that's one of our partnership with um, the Office of Special Education. Uh, we, we've really focused on the database that we have on ride times. What automated vehicle location will also help us with is that where it's an individual ride time of a, a special needs student, the, the, the system will actually tell us from the moment the door opened that they got on the bus at that bus stop for the ride time, not uh, that bus goes out for a long time which is where we currently are, we, and we do the best that we can with ride times. What it will tell us is, bus stopped at this stop, stop arm came out, door opened, door closed, off to school, and we'll be able to measure that and monitor it. So that where it makes sense, we'll, like for example, I'll use an example this year, we put on an extra bus for the Harbour School, um, one of our, our uh, non-pub schools. Well, we kind of just worked out that these we need to split this up, that's, the rides are too long. Automated vehicle location will tell us that student by student, and it will tell us who we should split up and who we should put where. So over this past year, have you seen a decrease in the ride times? Yes, uh, uh, we have because we've been able to work on them individually um, uh, with the Office of Special Education, identify them, um, and uh, I, I can't give you specific data yet. That's where we're really looking forward to this, to be able to to, to show those reductions. But I would say, yes, we have improved on ride times this year. Do you know what your longest ride time is right now? Uh, I have data back there. I don't have it right here with me. But I do have that data. We can get you that. Thank you. Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. Um, so this is the probably the department I know the least about, but um, I get the most complaints about, unfortunately. So I have a few questions, just um, as far as the, how the department works. So I understand you're the director, and then yep. is Mr. West is um, directly under Assistant you. director, yeah. And then how, how, is, how is it laid out beyond that, supervisors and then bus mm -hmm. drivers? and how is, how's So we have five geographical areas, okay. um, and each of those geographical areas has a senior operations supervisor um, in those five areas. Um, Four of those areas have two bus lots, and one of those areas has three bus lots. So we have el the 11 bus lots are managed um, by those uh, supervisors, and they have the staff that are in those areas uh, working for them. And is it one person who answers the phone at each bus lot? Um, so we have staff at the bus lots, um, which are, we have dispatchers and writing assistants, um, and uh, when you call the main number, 809-4321, that's coming to our office in Pulaski, where we have a dedicated phone team. Mm -hmm. um, our schools will often phone the bus lot because they've got a relationship with the routing assistant and the dispatcher. Um, and our customer service program will put a customer service agent in each bus lot. Because okay. if the writing assistant has to go out and drive that day, mm -hmm. there may be nobody at Rosedale, for example. Okay. But the customer service agent will be there moving forwards. Okay. Um, and with the new technology, it, it kind of sounds like a GPS slash ride time. Is there any other enhanced technology? I understand that before we were thinking of using the BCPS1 tags to um, monitor students getting in and off of the bus, but that doesn't seem like that's going to be um, implemented with this rollout. Is that still in the works? We, we don't have plans at this point in time for, for a, a student count system uh, okay. on the bus. Um, Technology is available, but we don't have, that's not in our current plan. Okay. No. And are, so students are not supposed to be sitting on the floor. Are they, if, if there's no place to sit, are they allowed to be standing while the bus is moving? It, the, the law allows standees in a, in a no, I'm going to say emergency situation, in a, a situation that needs to be facilitated, you know, short term. Okay. But we, we would then um, have to rectify that. Um, uh, and students are allowed to sit three to a seat, although that's, again, I said, that's not our goal mm -hmm. at all in, uh, in middle and high school. Standees, but no one's sitting on the floor? Correct. Okay. And, and then um, 
the, the my, I guess it's more of a suggestion or comment from what I've witnessed from parent meetings. I've, in fact, I was one, at one last night. And one of the things that what I'm hearing is that the, um, the connector, the, the report back from what happens on the bus is generally the teacher who's working kind of the bus line in the morning when the kids get off. Is there any other, I just don't think that's a very, um, not necessarily efficient, but very effective way for what's happening on the bus to get to the school, so to mm -hmm. get into the schools. Because if we're, I, I highly doubt it's gonna come from the students. It might come from the parents when the students complain to their parents. Mm -hmm. But um, just a suggestion that if we could have some sort of other intermediary, intermediary um, since we don't have cameras on the, well, we have yes, cameras, we do. but they do. Yeah, we do. And we have, really go anywhere. we have uh, bus referral forms that okay. the drivers and attendants can fill out. So, if, uh, and so if something happens on the bus or they observe something on the bus or it, it, yes, it can be a behavioral type scenario, but if they just observe something that they're concerned about, about a student, for example, and I've had those occasions where drivers have reported, hey, I'm just a bit worried about McRae, yeah. um, they can write that referral and, and that goes into the school and it's a, a, it's a tear off form that, that, that is given to the school. And we do have video cameras on all our board owned buses. Okay. So we are regularly viewing video footage. Uh, what does the professional development look like around those bus drivers being able to, or being knowledgeable about filling out those forms and being willing to fill out those forms? Because um, I know that our teachers, our full time mm -hmm. teachers have PD. Is there any? Yeah, we we, we cover that in our um, our in service training um, and reminding that referrals are there for. Um, so re you know, <coughs> most of our drivers fill out referral forms at some point in in the year. I would imagine some many more than just one or two, but uh, the the most most of them will fill out a referral form at some time in the year. Great, but, thank you. but we do want to make sure we continue to work closely with e each individual school. Absolutely. So the drivers um, sort of partner with the schools so we can um, provide whatever services and support we need for each and all of our students there. So they have the referral form, but we still like to work closely with schools, teachers, and principals to make sure that it is a collaborative effort and not just for us just filling out forms because ultimately we're trying to engage students and build relationships. Thank you. Mr. Yulefelder. Just one thing, one statistic we didn't hear. How many students do we transport? Uh, it fluctuates in the year, but it... No, I meant like on an average day. Yep. Yeah, um, so uh, <coughs> eligible students, we have 80,000 eligible students. And so depending on sports time of year, depending on many elements, you know, that could be, you know, Anywhere between seventy to eighty thousand in a day. One hundred and thirteen thousand, one hundred twelve thousand. That's, that's great. Big percentage. Mm -hmm. Couple more questions, and we can um, move on to the next agenda item because there's plenty more opportunity to talk to these gentlemen later. Mr. Birch. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you all for coming tonight. And um, really, the number of students who are eligible to be transported every day is really quite astonishing. It's, a, it's an amazing feat that happens. Uh, we tend to overlook that the first person, and this is not my original line, the first person that many of our students see is that driver, and the last person they see is that driver. I had the occasion to have some lunch on May 1st with one of our drivers with 20 years. Uh, I was over at McDonald's here in Towson, and uh, she, the, this driver was telling me about the specialized knowledge, notwithstanding the GPS, that, you know, so many feet past the four-way stop in the North Country and uh, just past that uh, uh, power pylon uh, where there is no mailbox, there is no uh, any box, there, there may be some kind of like place there, that that is a place where a student has to be picked up or dropped off. Um, I also spoke with a driver who didn't have 49 years or 46 years, they had 43 years, and uh, their tenant had a similar high number of years in our service. I did want to ask you about a couple of things, if I could. Um, in the presentation, you made reference to ESOL routing. Mm -hmm. And if you could just take just a brief moment to explain what that is, and then I just have a couple other very brief questions. Yeah, so we have um, some buses, and, uh, and thanks for your, your note that you sent um, about... Uh, there are more coming. Yeah. Um, so we have um, specific ESOL bus routes for particular programs um, uh, that uh, bring our, our students to those particular programs that are, are targeted. Um, the, 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 I think the note that you had was about uh, 
Sure. Actually, yeah, so one, my one question is, I mean, how do we how do we put piece together one of these routes? Um, so they are, uh, uh, we, will, we, we take the individual um, scenario and, and, uh, and it's similar to our, our displaced students also. Um, we really have to look at where those individuals come from um, and, and how we can uh, sort of, pe and I'm going to use the word piecemeal, you really do have to piece the route together because people are coming from uh, a lot of different locations to get to those programs. Right. So they're, they're, they're quite specialised and they they tend to be difficult to really get the bus filled up, if you will. So they tend to be, um, uh, they're some of the routes that make it difficult to put together, you know, four tiers, for example, like Kevin talked about earlier. Now, are there any specific ESOL program destinations that come to mind this evening? Um, no, we ha I mean, we have them uh, all, all over uh, our programs, to be honest. Um, uh, the, the question I think that you'd asked was, we, we have a slightly different structure in our um, elementary ESOL programs, and uh, I was speaking with Dr. McComas, and she can fill you in with that. Our ESOL programs in elementaries are, um, the, the transportation is the regular uh, home to school transportation in those programs, um, whereas in our high schools they're they're more specialised. Last question for Haya is: um, I had read a number of articles, and whether they're accurate or not, I'm, I'm primarily concerned about potential impact on our own system. Um, there was a new federal regulation, or relatively new, that drivers who previously may have been permitted to drive school buses, um, it related to, I don't know whether it was an apnea condition or whether it was the use of a CPAP, that those drivers were no longer permitted to drive buses. Is, is, that, a, is that a federal regulation that you're familiar with? Um, so I see you yawning there, but go ahead. <laughs> so all our drivers, uh, school bus drivers in the state of Maryland have an annual um, they have to have a DOT card annual. So if you're a regular CDL holder in a truck, you only need to do that every two years. School bus drivers have to do that every year. So if any uh, sleep disorder is either disclosed or th then, then that doctor may uh, prescribe a, a program, for example, f where the machine will test and th that, that, uh, that card may be put on hold. Um, and the driver has X amount of time to, to do that. So there are, there are many regulations like that where uh, a driver might get uh, a temporary DOT card if it's to do with medication or something like that, and sleep disorder is, is like you know, something similar to that. See, where I'm going with this is that to the extent there was a pool of drivers, and now there's fewer drivers, there may be any number of reasons for why the pool of drivers varies from one school year to the next. Yes, sir. Yep. Okay, all right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Mrs. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Smith and Mr. McCray. Um, I'm a little disappointed in that we don't have any metrics in this report. Um, when we had um, a report, I believe it was August or September, you had talked about a great deal of these things. Um, at, just as um, my fellow board member, Ms. Johnson, says, I get a lot of complaints about this. We got a tremendous, tremendous amount of complaints at the beginning of the year. Um, so I would like to see, and I don't, uh, hopefully we don't have to wait eight months to get the answers as we waited eight months from September until now to get an update. Um, what, are the, what are the baseline metrics? I know I got a lot of calls in my district, but I don't know how many calls um, others got. I don't know whether these situations were resolved or whether we still have parents concerned about their children waiting at the bus stop. I know when I attended a PTA meeting um, uh, with um, Ann Miller and um, some others at an elementary school, the PTA, um, and it was great that you were there, um, serious concerns about their children. And we don't have any metrics to tell us how we have done this year. How many complaints did we receive? How many of those um, complaints were resolved? And in what time frame? I ran into a parent um, who said it took him four weeks at the beginning of the year to get a stop moved from Shawan Road and 83, literally, to a safer spot in a cul-de-sac. Um, and it was only a 90-second difference in the bus, including turning around, because I drove there and, and mm -hmm. you know, 
did a little um, constituent service for that family. Um, so I would like to see as soon as possible what are our, our established call log baseline metrics. Um, the other thing, I mean, when, when would you be able to have that for us? Um, the system is just beginning now, the BCPS serve system. The, the statistics that we had, which were hand statistics last year, um, we do have a record of those. Okay, from so from the first uh, from the early part of the school year. Okay, so you so you at the beginning of the year cannot collect for us what happened to the how many complaints we received and how many uh, routes were adjusted to uh, to correct those problems and what the time frame was for any of those well, corrections. Um, the direction from this board is for us to address the problems that we have. And we can certainly run statistics, but every complaint or concern that we get, we follow up on. Now, if you want the statistics, we can do that. But my understanding is the goal is to resolve the matter. We're, we're building that metrics because that metrics is coming from in infancy to building it up, so we, we we will do that. But I don't want I don't want the impression from this board to be that we don't respond to every response that we get. We would ask that as as those concerns come in, that we get them in our office so that we can follow up on them. Because if not, and and they come to your queue and they they don't come to us, I don't know they exist, and so the team cannot work them through. I'm not saying that the ones that you have gotten that have not come to us, we try to follow up on every single one we have to make sure that we can work collaboratively with the school and those communities. As it relates to bus stops being moved, we get hundreds of those requests every single year. If we move every stop that someone wants, then I don't need a routing system. I just need to move stops. So we have to make sure that we're doing it in a timely fashion, that we evaluate each one, in addition to that, some of those routes, we feel like we need to bring in a third party to, to, for, for the sake of the public to make sure that we are um, looking at that route from our lens and we can have someone else to look at it uh, unob objectively about how that goes. So um, we're gonna address any problems that we have as we move forward through that. The, the issue is when we're trying to continuously improve or make drastic improvements as it seemed we needed to do in this department. It's good to know those numbers so we can see our improvement. So what, what this report is showing me is that we have no idea whether we've improved this year in terms of customer service, uh, rider time. You um, answered Ms. Miller's question in part about the special needs students and those rider times decreasing. But I know in my district and other districts, uh, typical students on typical routes also have very long ride times. So that's something that we would hope would decrease, uh, not just for our special needs kids, although it's certainly they have to be our priority, but for the other students as well. So we have no numbers related to that to know whether we've improved in that area. On our uh, routing system, we do have route sheets with times on it. But if, if you're asking me, do I have something that time stamps it and says this is when the bus arrived, that's what we're implementing. So it sounds like the new technology will be able to give greater data to you to be able to do your job better and perhaps even to have some kind of report uh, on performance and performance yep. improvement. But it's the new software and the new programs that are going to do that. Um, taking time to go through handwritten timesheets is not an effective use of anyone's time. Um, when would we be able to receive a BCPS serve report from the new service tracking system? BCPS serve just went live this month. So as, as we continue to develop it and we work through um, any adjustments that need to take place, we will get that with you. Um, I, I can work with the superintendent to get back to you as it relates to when that's gonna be, but we don't have enough data to even say when that report, when we can have a report for you. It just went live um, this month, so. But we, we that, will work with. I, I would say if that's something that this board wants to discuss and include as a key performance indicator going forward, we'll be able to identify when we can do that and then we'll be able to deliver data on that. But we have to, as a board, decide that's where we want to spend our time, perhaps when we meet in July, we can discuss that. I would ask that we please add that to the board retreat. Very good. Uh, Last question. Discussion. Last question. 
Mrs. Miller. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned that uh, in response to uh, Ms. Eaton's question about overcrowding that you've been addressing that when you become aware of it. And that statement is bothersome to me. But what is more bothersome is that we've been getting reports from, you know, parents who come and address the board and, and contact us and whatnot about overcrowding. So it is happening. So for the, the public, can you tell the public right now where and how they should be notifying on these issues? And when I, I said that, uh, we also monitor our, our supervisors and the schools are working with us um, to monitor you know, actual ridership. Um, all inquiries can come into our, our main uh, office uh, inquiries line, which is 443-809-4321. Um, is there an email address as well? Yes, there is a, a contact us transportation email address, and that's available on the website. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Miller, you yes. asked a really good question. I think Mr. McCray alluded to it earlier. Um, our ridership fluctuates as it relates to as the different times of the year, sports and things of that nature. So we range from 70,000 to 80,000 riders per day. So every time that we see that fluctuation, and we know when those seasons change, but we have to monitor that. And when we do, we work closer with the schools if we need to allocate um, different resources or reprogram um, um, pickups and things of that nature. So we try to work with the individual schools. Our goal is to make sure we're trying to be good stewards with our resources and not just allocate resources and then we have buses that are grossly under capacity. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. McRae. Thank you. It's been informative and we appreciate the effort that you're making to make our system better. Thank you. Next on our agenda is agenda item L, board member comments. We're only about 25 minutes behind schedule. Um, <laughs> Mr. Stewart. I only have 30 minutes of comments, so buckle yeah. up. Uh, just congratulations to Ms. White, and I think that it's going to be an exciting time for the system to continue forward, um, to press ahead on the urgent matters before us, but to have an opportunity to um, reflect on where we've been and where we're going together um, in partnership. This is Eaton. I haven't said this for a while. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Causey. Thank you. Um, I just wanted also to personally say congratulations to Ms. Verlita White. Um, uh, although I agree uh, that there was, the process was not as transparent, inclusive, and robust as I believe it could have been, we did have many stakeholders wanting to have their concerns and suggestions included. And there was also much suspense along the way. Um, everyone's saying, what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? So in any case, we all know now. And ultimately, I'm very encouraged by the board's unanimous decision to appoint Ms. Verlita White as our interim superintendent, um, not only because of all of what we have seen um, as we interact with her on the board, but also the amount of her education, educator experience since 1992 and all of the things that uh, my board member pointed out earlier, but her dedication to Baltimore County, having grown here, graduated from Woodlawn, being a longtime teacher and administrator, and now a parent of BCPS students. And I am also, so uh, that's, I just think that's wonderful. Um, I also appreciate her focus uh, that she talked about on literacy and also dealing with the social, emotional, physical, as well as the educational needs of each and every child in our county. So I'm very um, excited to work with the board and her as we move through this transition time. And while there are many challenges, many we've heard here tonight, uh, including all the issues that the stakeholders bring before the administration and the board through meetings, TABCO, CASE, advisory councils, um, and some of the key issues, one Ms. Miller pointed out, are their behavior and discipline, where we need to have safe places for teaching and for learning. Also, the literacy rates uh, need to be improved. And as you heard, there are things that we're doing now, but we also need to look at um, what is already working well in our school system and doing more of that. Um, constructions, facilities, and transportation. So while there is a lot that Ms. White's walking into, we all are prepared to work together, as Mr. Stewart said. Um, also, I would like to briefly touch on the Victory Villa boundary um, situation that we are going to be um, 
deliberating and then voting on at the next meeting. And I just want to say the board has received many emails regarding this for months, actually, and many more recently, especially um, related to the uh, hearing that we had. Even tonight, we heard about community members concerned about the flaws that they saw in the process. Um, one suggestion I would make um, is to have alternates for each of the voting committee members that must attend the meetings along the way. And then at each opportunity where there is voting taking place, that there would be the full amount of voting members that are representing each school um, and each community, because that is such an important part of the process. But also, I would like to say that um, along the way in the discussions that we've had, many people are saying that we should respect the process. Um, and I think that that's absolutely true. There's a lot of people that have worked very hard on this. But I also want to point out that public input and the board public hearing are part of the process. And if no adjustments are possible after the public input and hearing, why have them? But we do have them because they have meaning. Of course it is appropriate for the board to make adjustments as additional information is brought forward and there is time to reflect. If the Boundary Committee gets it mostly right, it is still ultimately the board's responsibility to determine the best solution. Cropper said there's no perfect solution. However, our motto is the pursuit of deliberate excellence. So let's keep reflecting, let's keep striving for the best solution for all schools and all communities. And lastly, I just want to say that I really enjoyed uh, some school visits I had recently, and I wanted to thank Community Superintendent Dr. Craig Cuellar, if he's still awake over there in the corner, there you are. And um, also the principals that were uh, just wonderful hosts, and it was really encouraging to go through the system and see the wonderful things that are happening. Principal Sam Weinkoop, Deborah Magnus, and Deborah Miller. Uh, Delaney, as um, Ms. Baton pointed out, had some sweltering days last week, and despite me visiting first thing in the morning, which I believe was strategic decision on someone's part, um, the teacher, it was still hot, but in spite of that, the teachers and the students are dedicated to their academic success, their athletic success, the success that they have in their extracurricular activities, the Future Business of Leaders uh, Association. Um, we saw some wonderful things going on in language arts, world languages, computer science. It was really uh, phenomenal and really great to get into the buildings and interact with the students and teachers. At Cockeysville Middle, we saw a lot of great learning going on um, and also a very well-maintained school. They did win the Silver Hammer Award last year uh, from Comptroller Franchot's office. Uh, but one thing that was really neat that we saw was the physical education class and that they do that program every day in every grade. Um, and even as we were visiting, there was a group from uh, Maryland State Department of Education that's studying their program of physical activity every day. The school's high achieving and the administrators feel that that extra uh, time that the kids get to interact with each other and exercise may even help lessen behavior issues because they have um, good statistics in that regard. Also, I wanted to uh, say thank you to Jacksonville Elementary School. They pointed out they had made some incredible strides in student achievement. I'm not going to say the numbers, but they were phenomenal um, in literacy and mathematics. And one of the things that I thought that was really neat about the school is that they have so many places involved in literacy. They have the library. Then they have a student level library where the students can go in knowing their reading level and choose to pick something in their level or pick to be a little challenged and move up a level. The teachers have a teacher level library where they can go and get resources for various students in a variety of um, abilities and, and have a, um, a ready resource available for them to enrich their, their um, instruction. Uh, they also have a Ben Carson reading room. So in terms of us working on literacy and focusing how, on how we can continue to improve those numbers, I'd say let's take a look because they're doing phenomenal things. So with that, um, I did just want to point out one other thing. I get all kinds of, um, we all get all kinds of magazines. One I get is from um, one fine, one of the fine public universities in Maryland. And in it was an article I just wanted to point out to the stars, it's a University of Maryland engineering grad who will be the first African American International Space Station crew, crew member. And that's going to be, um, she's going to be working and living alongside a Russian mission commander and a German fellow crew member. And I just, after we went to the National School Board Association um, conference out in Denver, where they had um, astronaut Scott Kelly as a keynote speaker, uh, I just thought that this was phenomenal and I wanted to bring this because we are trying to increase underrepresented groups in STEM. 
And it's just phenomenal when you have real life success stories of what can happen when you have students that are encouraged to uh, expand their, their interests and just go as far as they can go, and she's going to outer space. So I just wanted to point, uh, point out that there are success stories all around, and it's good to see them. Mr. Yulfelder. I'm Pace. How was that one? That's very good. <laughs> we'll pick up the pace here. This is White. <laughs> Ms. Yeah. Johnson. I agree. Uh, congratulations, Ms. White. And all I can say is black girl magic. <laughs> okay, now our Villanova bound yeah. student member, Aislinn Brad. Um, I just wanted to echo some of the other things said about Ms. White. Um, I really enjoyed my year of working with you, and I'm very excited um, that you were selected for our interim. So, congratulations and good luck. <laughs> Thank you, Aislinn. Mr. Virch. Uh, I would just like to um, commend uh, my colleagues for the recognition of the single most emergent matter that was confronting the system, and that was the however condition because of additional contract matters to follow. Uh, and that was the appointment, the announcement of the conditioned appointment of Verlita White, who I've spoken at length already this evening. Um, secondly, goodbye to our Aislinn, uh, and best of luck at Villanova. Um, I, as a board member, I've had quite a fun time this month. Uh, I was at a uh, Love Thy and Neighbor dinner at the Islamic Society of Baltimore. Um, if any of our members uh, have the opportunity to, to go to such an event, it is well worth the experience. Um, I also was able to go and tour our Overly High School with uh, Monica Sample, the principal. A lot of good things going on at our school in addition to the um, air conditioning work that's occurring there. I also toured our Shady Spring Elementary School with uh, Ken Dunaway, and I was able to, to go to the class where um, art teacher uh, Miss Farami uh, was, <coughs> was conducting class. I saw one of her students uh, works of art at the Baltimore Museum of Art, and I was able to compliment the teacher about that, and uh, um, she really was kind of thrilled with the fact that somebody was making connections with her own students. Uh, there was this fantastic senior art uh, reception at our Carver High School, followed by a film premiere, and if you have the chance to do that, I would suggest to my board members, you should definitely do it. It is a fun event. The film premiere is also cool. Uh, first, on the art reception, you get to talk to the students and see their work. And when you ask them if they can sort of, you know, take a moment and share it with you, it's always good to preface it by saying, now, I don't want you to explain your vision in such a way that it would limit any future interpretation of the meaning of your work. Um, the uh, films uh, really is the multi-year, uh, the film premiere is really a, a multi-year project of uh, Ali Khalid, and you'll see his name as a credit on many of the students' uh, films. He's the lighting guy, but he really has been one of the driving forces behind that very, very successful uh, effort. Uh, one of the other uh, artists who I met was Omar Harris, whose brother was there, uh, and his brother's been used as sort of like the model for some of the, some of the works that are posted up on, on the wall. Uh, and last night I was at the uh, Northeast Education Advisory Council, and it's good to touch base with our advisory councils uh, because of the additional input and feedback that, uh, that they provide to us. Uh, once again, congratulations that we've, however conditionally, addressed the single most emergent matter facing our system, the, uh, the public naming of a interim superintendent to take our schools in the future deeper on many of the matters that have been initiated already. Thank you so much. Mrs. Miller. Thank you, and congratulations to Ms. White. I look forward to uh, working with you in a broader scope than our work together on the Safety and Technology Committee. And I hope that um, the school system will put discipline and safety issues as a number one priority um, I, uh, I'm hearing incidences of school violence in BCPS on a daily basis, whether it's in the news or from uh, parents and teachers contacting me or on social media. Um, it's alarming and heartbreaking. Uh, we have some really atrocious video out there of incidences. Uh, many students and teachers are afraid to go to school. And this is an escalating issue, and I fear it's coming to a breaking point. Um, 
Our leadership must take immediate steps to address the issues at their root and to formulate a long-term strategy as well. Um, on, uh, related to that, on April 18th, the board voted to hold a public input hearing on discipline in order to improve our discipline policies to make them effective. Now, with the departure of our PRC chair, Romaine Williams, and the resignation of Dr. Dance, the hearing has not yet been scheduled. But I ask that the PRC take this issue up again as a priority. And finally, I make my repeated que re request to be able to serve on the PRC. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Uh, 27 graduations to come before our next board meeting on June 13. Uh, we uh, have a capital budget hearing tomorrow night. Um, we have uh, a uh, national holiday on Monday the 29th, and we have our next board meeting on June 13. We're adjourned.